I grew up going to public high school, went to public elementary school, mm -hmm. and you know, a, as far as back as I could remember, just going into science classes and learning about the overwhelming evidence for evolution. Mm -hmm. Now, how can a trained PhD scientist like you reject the overwhelming, uh, you know, information and data and science and evidence regarding evolution? I don't reject the evidence, okay? What I reject is the interpretation of that evidence. And I think this is something that you don't have to be a scientist to understand. You know, different people are going to see the same evidence in different ways. Okay? And this is something that I think my upbringing among cultures other than my own helped me to appreciate just a little bit. Because what you're saying here is that when it comes to all the data, specifically the data, the data is not contradictory to somebody who is a believer in scripture, but rather it's the interpretation that is the problem, and that's where we see differences. Precisely, precisely. Um, look, the reality is this. We all have different ways of looking at the world, and every one of those ways leaves us wondering about some of the things that we see. I was left wondering, how can there be so much evil in the world? How can that exist? How can God be good and allow this to happen? How can God be love? and allow it to happen. Isn't that the uh, challenge uh, though for creation scientists, promoting intelligent design, yet at the same time seeing a world that's fallen, that's broken. There's a tension there. It, you know, yeah. for the evolutionist, the atheist evolution, he can just say, no, the whole world came about through, through natural means, through randomness, through uh, chance. But for the, the Bible believer, the, the, isn't. Yeah, the struggle, suffering and death is the miracle that brought you about. You know, it's a good thing. Be thankful for it. You know, that's how uh, Darwin and those who agree with him really were able to turn those things around. So as a Christian, I view the suffering and death of other people, and myself, by the way, as evil, intrinsically evil. Darwinism does not do that. In addition to that, Darwinism, and this is a really controversial thing, it doesn't matter how much a person denies this, it prevents us from viewing each other as equal. Interesting. Okay? Because selection must work on differences, right? Differences in fitness. And so this actually brings things around a little bit full circle for me. It's helped me at least a little bit to understand that both fascism and Marxism spring from the same foundation. And that foundation is Darwinism. Interesting. Okay. So a lot of yeah. ideologies, very dangerous ideologies that have been responsible for atrocities they come, they spring from this, this sort of philosophical underpinnings of evolution, which simply says that human beings are not all equal. Exactly. Con uh, the concept of struggle, okay, is central to both of these political philosophies. And uh, fascism has a tendency to put it at the point of, um, of races and tribes, okay, fighting one another. So the, 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 the Nazis believed the Germanic people were going to wipe everybody else out. They were the highest, uh, most evolved group, okay? And all the inferior peoples, it was their job to go extinct. I remember learning about a book, which was the foundation of evolution called The Origin of Species, but I heard that that's not the full title of that book. It does talk about the survival of favored races. Um, over the course of time. I want to d defend Darwin a little bit with that. He was talking about 
uh, different variations of different kinds of organisms, not just human beings. However, Darwin did write another book called The Descent of Man, which is about the most racist book you could ever read. Yeah, this is the foundation of, of science in, in public high school and college. It is certainly a philosophy that is pushed. Actually, I would call it a religious philosophy, um, uh, just as religious as Catholicism or Hinduism or, or any other ism. Darwinism is a religious uh, thing because, in fact, it is not founded in the authority that science is supposed to be founded in, which is data. It is founded in, on certain philosophical, or shall we call them metaphysical presuppositions that are not scientifically testable. Is there anything good in evolution that we can say, this does not contradict scripture, this is something we can embrace, this is something that's obvious, this is something that's true? Sure. Remember, evolution has many different meanings when people use it. So you've got to be careful in your discussion. Right. But um, the concept of adaptation, right? Different organisms are adapted to, to different environments. There are questions about how they achieve that. That's what I study in my lab. But, um, you know, what those mechanisms are. They are certainly not always natural selection, I'll tell you that. But you'll remember that in the Bible, God twice tells humans and then humans and the animals after the flood to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. What that tells you is that God created organisms with the ability to vary in such a way that they are well adapted to the different environments that you find around the earth. So you can find foxes in the Arctic and uh, you know foxes in England and uh, here in North America as well. So they're, you know, and they are different, but they're adapted to these different, different circumstances. So adaptation so. is something we can clearly see. We can see these adjustments to, their, to the environment. And the speed with which organisms achieve that is amazing. Clearly, God made organisms with the ability to adapt to different environments and changing environments. That's incredible. So when it comes to the scriptures and when we look at the Bible and we see a framework of how we're to view the world, what is that framework when we view nature, when we view um, the world around us? Well, I would say that it is really two conflicting things that you've already touched on. One, you have God getting to the end of the creation and saying, very good. It is very good. That should tell us as Christians, as we study nature, to expect good things. Not necessarily to expect everything to be bad or broken or, or whatever, but to expect good things. And then there is the fall. And so what we are looking at is essentially, in my mind, the equivalent of the Venus de Milo. Okay? Um, it's a beautiful but broken thing, okay? but it is beautiful. Right. And uh, so to, to expect beauty. Now, Dr. Standish, I've got to ask you this really challenging question. Let's say you didn't grow up in a Christian household. You didn't have a Christian family. You didn't go to church as a young person. What would make you believe that this world came about because of a creator? That's a great question. And there are people who have actually, because of scientific arguments, come to come to this belief. So, for example, the, the famous atheist Anthony, Anthony Flew became not a believer in Christianity, but a believer in some kind of intelligent design or something like that on the basis of the scientific evidence. However, um, 
the scientific evidence doesn't answer every question that uh, that a person could have in you know about these things probably uh, the philosopher um, uh, Anselm of Canterbury uh, said it best he he said I don't um, uh, strive to understand in order to believe I believe in order to understand and what I've found as a Christian is that Christianity provides me with the most coherent perspective for looking at the evidence and making sense of it. It doesn't mean that I have every answer or anything like that. Um, you probably get that I'm interested in, in, <laughs> in philosophers and Confucius really did say um, this, which I think was quite profound, which is, uh, let me tell you what true knowledge is. True knowledge is to know what you do know and to know what you don't know. Much of the confusion I see in this area, I think is attributable to people who think they know what they don't know. And uh, the bottom line is when you're dealing with time, uh, you can't go back in time and see what happened. You, you, you know, I can't go back to the creation and see what happened, but at least I've got an eyewitness account. Um, if not in Genesis 1, at least in Exodus, where God gives the Ten Commandments and the Fourth Commandment spells out, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. So at least it gives, you know, that's God himself there talking. Right. Um, so he was there, he saw what he, what he did, and that helps to provide this, this framework. N you know, so I can't go back in time, neither can anybody else, but we can look at evidence today and uh, see things that point very clearly towards some kind of creation. So what is the evidence that you see that points to a creator? The number one thing for me is evidence of a plan over time. Okay. And I brought a couple of pictures along that, that to, to, to show this. The first one shows an early stage of a chick embryo. And you can see that there is a structure there in the middle. It's something, but it's definitely not like a chick or a chicken. Nothing, you know, it's, it's not even close. There is a program there that is being worked out over time. And when you have something like that, you have to anticipate the future. The only thing we know of that is capable of anticipating the future is a mind. Um, nature itself doesn't anticipate the future. So here is a later stage and you can see there are little, little buds coming out there that are going to be limbs. So the wings and the, and, the, and the legs, and you can see an eye forming and a brain and, and other things. And of course, we all know what a chick looks like when it comes out of an egg and what a chicken looks like. There is a whole trajectory over time and it is going towards a specific goal. There's a word for that, teleology. 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 It is when, some, when there is a goal out there in time that is worked towards. The problem is that nature doesn't have a mind. So nature cannot anticipate that in the future something's gonna need this. It can't anticipate that an egg is going to need legs or a beak or anything. Okay? It can't anticipate those tiny little molecular machines that they will require all the little bits and pieces to be present all at once for them to have their function. In other words, not something that can evolve incrementally which is central to the idea of evolution. And Darwin pointed this out. 
you know, that, that if it could be demonstrated that anything um, in, in biology, and I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, could not be produced by small incremental gradual changes, then his theory would collapse. Well, molecular machines demonstrate that. They require teleology, all the parts in place. A chicken requires teleology, all the parts in place. A human being requires teleology, a plan with a goal out in time. Now, there's, a, there's another illustration here, and this particular one I wanted to put up because it has been presented as one of the greatest evidences for evolution. This was um, drawn by a, a German naturalist, and you can see the early stages of development up there at the top. His name was Ernst Haeckel, okay? and, um, and then later stages and then at the bottom there, what these things are turning into. So we've got, you know, fish and salamander and tortoise and all these things. In this illustration, everything's really similar at the start and different at the end. There's a different teleology there. There are two issues with this. Number one, and the most important one, these drawings don't resemble reality in any way. And yet, they appear in textbooks as evidence of evolution that I have used in public schools here in the United States. When he first published these, he was immediately accused of fraud and convicted. Okay? And yet, they appear in textbooks today. Everybody who knows anything about embryology understands that that is not a real depiction of what goes on. What happens is things actually start out quite different. They do converge a little bit in general terms and then diverge quite a bit. What you can see is the laying down of that general plan, in this particular case of vertebrates, and then the diversification there. So the major problem, though, is the fact that this is a fraud. Speaking and of fraud, are there other examples of fraud that have occurred, uh, you know, when it comes to promoting or pushing evolutionary Sure, theory? you have things like Piltdown Man and, and so on. People commit frauds with this stuff on, uh, no matter what they're trying all fronts. to, on all fronts. Next up, we're going to get some questions from our studio audience. We have any questions? Right over there. Do you think that the progression of wolves to all of the dog breeds we have now is a result solely of adaptation? And particularly something that's plagued me for years is how do we get from wolves to chihuahuas? Yeah. <laughs> um, I do not believe it's a result of adaptation. I believe that wolves are a result of adaptation, okay? Um, having said that, the when, when you look at breeds, what we call dog breeds, most of them have been produced actually within the last couple of hundred years. There are certain ancient breeds like, um, which, of the, which of the corgis are supposed to be like a thousand years old or something? I think Afghan hounds are supposed to be pretty old as well. But, um, but basically, uh, what's gone on with dog breeds, as I understand it is, uh, yes, dogs have associated themselves with, with human beings. Uh, you go to most cities in the world and you see there are wild dogs living there in, in those cities alongside human beings. And you've probably noticed they all kind of look the same. They have a tendency to have short coats and be medium sized and all of those sorts of things. Um, uh, those breed, those distinctive breeding breed traits are actually hard to maintain and they've been produced as a result of careful crossing of breeds that already exist and then selective breeding with the, with the progeny. So that's where most of, it's mostly human vanity imposed on these creatures. I'd like to talk to the person who came up with the idea of chihuahuas. We'd have a yeah, long so conversation, <laughs> right? We got time for any other questions right over there. 
Dr. Standish, you imply that humans didn't evolve, but how do you explain modern day evolution with regard to ring species, or how a specific type of Australian lizard went from laying eggs to live births? Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me uh, assure you that I don't know everything. Uh, so I want to be very careful. I'm not an expert on herpetology and how, you know, what realistic explanations might be uh, when it comes to ring species. I do have a general understanding. So I will give you a response, but please, please understand this is a general kind of response, not a response from somebody who is expert in this field. So if you hear something different, that might be better uh, than, than what I have to offer. Let's start off with ring species. A ring species is basically a, an organism that goes all the way around the world. So for example, there's a kind of, um, uh, or a group I should say, of gulls called loris gulls. And um, you can find these things all over the place. I believe kelp gulls uh, belong in that group. Uh, Glaucus wing gulls out on the, on the west coast and so on. And you look at these things and, and you recognize them. I mean, they, they really look like a kind of, of seagull. But there are differences between them. And as you go around the world, you get to the other side and uh, those ones over there are incapable of breeding with the ones over, over here. And so they fit one kind of definition of what a species is. Bear in mind, species definitions are a big deal and there are a lot of different definitions of what a species is. But these two groups, uh, even though they kind of connected all the way around the world, they just, they, they, they are incapable of breeding with one another. So, uh, you know, um, it's, they're different species, different biological species. And uh, I guess the way that I would respond to that is, the miracle is that things can interbreed with one another. Losing the ability to interbreed seems like the sort of thing that could occur by accident, you know, uh, by mutation or whatever. And I don't want to get too deeply into the uh, complexities of anatomy and physiology as to why it might be that, uh, you know, two organisms might no longer be able to interbreed with one another, but just, you know, use your imagination change the size or shape of certain bits and pieces, and you're going to have some difficulties there. So, um, and, and at the molecular level, you can have the same kind of thing going on. Breeding and reproduction are really complex things. So break something or change something just a little bit, and you, it, it, it's, it's easy to understand how you could get isolation there. Um, uh, the, uh, the Australian lizard going from laying eggs to live birth. <sighs> Again, I, I want to be really careful, but um, uh, it doesn't seem like the most difficult thing to achieve. Um, uh, for example, if, if you have the, um, uh, the young basically hatching out of the eggs before they're born or something like that. I'm not an expert in that, but there is a book that I could recommend for you called The Edge of Evolution by somebody named Michael Behe. It's an excellent book that explores what we can reasonably expect from random, unguided processes versus what we would expect from a designed 
situation that will give you a much better understanding than, than I can give you here. Thank you, Dr. Standish. Thank you so much for being willing to engage our audience. You've uh, shared with us some of your wonderful responses and great questions for us. And thank you for the call to be good students and good researchers for ourselves.